Log management is an important topic. To discuss it, we will use information from a best practices white paper from RSA, which is a division of EMC. Managing all of these logs becomes pretty important to you. If you have all this information and you can't get at it, obviously it does you no good at all. If you are like most sites, you have a large number of systems and services reporting to you. Managing those in a way that you can get at them becomes important. If you have to go to every system and service you have to get at the logs, you'll be wasting a lot of time, and chances are you'll miss a lot of important things. Log management is all about trying to bring those logs to a place where they are secure and reliable and accessible, where you can get at them and correlate them. Establishing those operational procedures for this is pretty important. In a lot of cases, in a fairly large project, it requires specific services just for log management. You might have a host set up just to handle logs. You have them locked down and very secure. They don't do anything else, just logging. They're not accessible from the outside. That way, if your system is attacked from the outside, you know your logs are still safe and secure. This is important. You don't want your logs to be compromised. Ensure that you're logging across all your systems and services. When you identify all your assets and your risks, this is a point where you can go back to your risk assessment. You can begin to understand and identify all the systems and services you need to be logging. When you go back through your risk assessment, you want to look at each asset and figure out where that log information is going and is the right information being collected. Make sure you capture all that information, that you store it somewhere for a defined amount of time, and make sure you don't lose it. What you are capturing is relative to your policy. You don't want to capture information that might be private if it goes against your privacy policy. For example, like we said earlier, when using NetFlows, we only capture the header information because capturing the full packet would go against our university's privacy policies. We could do that, but we'd have to get permission for special cases. Make sure your timestamps are synchronized. Say you have a hundred systems and they all have different time frames on them. They have different timestamps of them for the same time. That makes it really hard to walk back through and see when something happened. It would become almost impossible to know the chronological order of an incident. So having a time protocol of some type will help make sure this kind of problem does not occur. When collecting and storing log information, watch for sensitive information. This might go beyond things like PPI or PHI. You might have DOD activities going on that you need to protect the information of, or even private partners that might have sensitive information, or information on what machines they logged onto and how they submitted jobs, or even what jobs they ran. This could include individuals doing the same things. Be aware of sensitive data and your need to protect it. It is not an uncommon practice for attackers to go after the log files. They know that these will give information about their activities, so they try to erase their footprints. Thus, it becomes very important for you to pull all your log files together and keep them in a secure location so they cannot be compromised. Along with keeping logs secure comes the issue of storage. There are a lot of log files and they begin to take up a lot of space. Typically, projects don't have large disk farms for log file storage. Money is spent on supporting the activities of scientists and meeting their needs. You will have to make a determination of how much storage space you can use for log files and then develop a plan that will allow you to keep as much data for as long as possible. Defining what is the lifetime for this is something that you have to figure out. Do you need to keep data for a month, or do you need to keep it for a few years? This is a determination you need to make an address. The best situation is to be able to retain your information in online storage. This gives you the fastest access and allows you to do the most with your data. However, if this is not viable, you will need to start putting your information onto some type of offline storage. Just realize this will make it more difficult and time consuming to find the information you need. If you have a backup routine, this could be a way of addressing your log file storage. You keep the logs on the system for as long as you can, but then if you know you have backups being taken of these log files, 
you can start to rely on that for long-term storage of information. Make sure you regularly review and analyze your logs. Now you're going to have techniques and automated ways of looking through these files, and you should try to automate the log analysis as much as you can. But in the years of experiences we've had at NCSA, we've learned that automated analysis tells you one thing, but many times someone still gets in and looks around and finds things. As good as automated tools are, they are still not a complete replacement for visual review of the logs. As an individual gains experience with log review, they can often catch things that a program has missed. As we said, you should have an automated review system. You will most likely have so many files coming in that you will quickly be overwhelmed by the information. An automated tool is critical for dealing with this. However, don't rely on that tool alone. You still need to get in there and look around a bit on your own. The analysis tools are going to do some correlation for you. They might be looking for some specific event or other triggers that you could never find on your own. These tools become very important with helping you manage all the data you'll be getting from your log files. A result that you will probably start to notice is that these tools give off a number of false positives. This means that you need to look for other things to let you know if a single event or alert matters. If you get a little single alert, it may not mean anything, and you probably don't need to escalate that up unless you start seeing multiple alerts and events related to it. Report generation is an important part of these tools. You will want nice reports being printed that are easy to look at and easy to understand. Often these tools, as a part of the report generation, will signal the items they think are important and that you need to address. This can be very helpful. It can help you set your daily priorities and figure out how to make the system better. Some of your systems might also require real-time monitoring. Understanding the need for this type of monitoring and including it in your procedure is important. Figuring out how it feeds into your log review and analysis routine is an important activity that needs to be clearly documented. You will likely be dealing with a lot of false alarms. This is particularly true when you first set things up. You don't want to have to sort through those all of the time. After you get going for a while, you will just sort of naturally get into a rhythm of identifying false alarms and real ones. As you gain experience and understanding of your systems and reports, you'll be able to go back and tune your analysis tools and reduce the number of false alerts. When it comes to log protection, make sure you secure your process that generates all your logs. We've had a number of incidents over the years where we know a system is not reporting the way it's supposed to, and that's because we had monitoring of our monitoring systems so that we know that a certain system or service while it was set up to report, is not reporting like it should. That could mean that either somebody's changed that on us, so we need to take a little closer look to see what's going on, or in most cases, it's just a misconfiguration. This could be due to a change in the OS or to the network configuration, and now the system is not reporting the way it's supposed to. Log information can be pretty sensitive information or can become that way. So you don't just want it sitting out in the open for everyone to access. Put some thought in how you're going to set things up for people who need to have access. How are you going to transfer files? Put some thought into this part of managing your log files. In order to help with protecting your storage, run hashes on your operating system files. That way you know if the information has changed. Along with this, make sure you can identify any change as something you did or someone else did. You should address physical security concerns too. If your university does not provide server rooms for you to run your machines in, then you need to figure out how you're going to secure them. Obviously, if your log files are generating sensitive information, you do not want them sitting out in the open. Here is a list of tools. There are a lot more out there if you look around, but these are some that we found that could be useful. Splunk is one that a lot of organizations use today. It's a little expensive, although through Internet 2, a university can get a better pricing model, so you might want to take advantage of that. You'll find that a lot of industry is using Splunk for their log analysis. It's a very good tool. If you're only looking at your logs once in a while, it's probably not worth it. But if you have security professionals regularly looking at the results, 
then it is probably worth the price. Grow also has the ability to do some analysis for you. If you have a programmer available, Bro provides its own programming language. So basically, if you can think of it, you can get Bro to do it. The other tools listed help with the correlation of the log information and a certain amount of analysis. As you can see, we've provided links to each of these tools, so take a look at them and see what they can do for you. Containment is a difficult challenge. Being prepared to do containment is really pretty much dictated by each individual incident, so it is hard to tell you what steps to take and in what order. This will really be determined by the incident and what is going on in real time. You might have to do anything from disconnecting the internet, which is a process that will protect you from the outside, or disabling user accounts or privileges. This can go from a single user to an entire system. It's not something that you'd like to do, but sometimes it is what is needed. Firewalls and blocks are a good thing. If you know where the attack is coming from, you could quickly block it and stop it from occurring. Black hole routing is a technique where you make it look like things are being routed somewhere, but they're really not going anywhere. This allows you to monitor things for a while and see what's going on. During an incident, you will probably increase your monitoring too. You will probably make changes to some of your monitoring routines to really focus on specific things. As you see what is going on in the incident, you will get an idea of the types of activities you're looking for, so you will begin to monitor for those specifically. During containment, you will really be going through a refinement cycle. That is why increased monitoring is important. It might not seem like monitoring is containment in any way, but what it is doing is giving you the information you need to react a lot more quickly to something and get it contained. The steps of eradication are a little bit more straightforward, but can also be a difficult set of steps to predict. This is because eradication depends on what actually happened. So hopefully all the information you have gathered in the previous steps has told you what you needed to do. If you have investigated things properly, you should know what was affected during the incident. Now you can figure out what needs to be done to get rid of anything bad on your system and restore it back to working order. Eradication is really dictated by the scope of the incident and understanding what happened. The decisions you make will also be closely tied to the recovery systems and what you have available there. A lot of times the eradication requires you to get back to a specific version of software in order to get rid of the holes that were put into the system. Often this means going back to software that you need to reapply from your backup services and restoring the system to a state prior to the incident. During recovery, you will again have to make a determination based on what you have discovered throughout the incident. You might have to do very little in the way of recovery, or you might have to reinstall everything. This might even include having to go back and restore data. If you discovered they had access to data and made changes there, you might need to recover to your last checkpoint to ensure good data. Once you know the full extent of the incident, you will have an idea of how the recovery will proceed. You might have to notify additional people that something happened on the system. Oftentimes you have made some notifications, but now you might need to let more people know. For example, letting users know there had been an incident on the system could help with the recovery process. The users could start letting you know about things that don't look right or that have been changed during recovery. Take the time to evaluate who might need to be notified about the incident and how various notifications could be helpful to you. If you would like more help with building a security system, please contact CTSC. You can get contact and other information on the CTSC website, trustedci.org. CTSC Online is made possible by funding from NSF, grant number OCI, 1234408.